just to say for those who, who don't know me and who didn't um, see me in the campaign, I was a civil servant, so I've been in the civil service for 15 years. I joined in 1996 um, as a European fast streamer. Um, and at the time, um, I really, really wanted to go to Brussels, actually. But I joined at a time when they didn't have the Concorde for Brussels for four years. So I ended up in this big backlog of fast streamers um, and decided instead uh, to get married and have um, two beautiful children. And so I joined the domestic fast stream. And I do want to say, because I thought about this very carefully today, I loved my career in the civil service, I really did. And I did some fantastic jobs. I, I worked on a whole range of issues. Um, I did policy making in transport, in environment, in local government. I was very involved in the start of the um, Kyoto and climate change negotiations. Uh, I've worked with lots of ministers, um, several prime ministers. So it's a fantastic um, career. However, for me personally, what I wanted to talk about today really is kind of why I decided to leave, what made me come to that decision, and then my experiences of the campaign, and actually why I think it would have been fantastic if I could have run this campaign before having my career in the civil service, because I learned so much during the campaign that I think is relevant for everybody in the room. And actually, I did a, a talk yesterday for Women a Personal Impact course and was just saying that so many things that I had to do um, during the campaign, I think would be really helpful for, for people in whatever um, sector you're working in, whatever career you're in. So in terms of, um, kind of my decision to leave the civil service, um, I think I knew for probably two or three years really, and certainly since the last general election, that I wasn't in the right place anymore. Um, and I suspect there are quite a few civil servants who feel the same way that I did, in that I'd only ever been in the civil service really under one administration. I came in in 1996 just before the election that brought Labour in, and I'd only ever worked under a Labour government, and I didn't know how I was going to feel with the change of government. Um, and I stayed, I was then in the Department of Health, so I'd worked in the Cabinet Office for the last six years, but moved to the Department of Health around the time of the general election. Um, and I felt very uncomfortable in the role I was in. I worked um, for the Permanent Secretary, I was helping to set up the new board in the Department of Health, so I was right there at the centre. And I also saw the, um, some of the conversations with the opposition around the election. Um, I know as a civil servant that part of your job, and my first ever grade seven told me this, part of, part of your job, you will always have to implement policies that you don't agree with, and you do it in the name of democracy. And that's absolutely right, and that's what's so fantastic about the UK civil service, that impartiality that we have. Personally, for me, and it's so liberating having left the civil service now that I can say these kind of things. Personally, for me, I didn't feel like I was helping to support democracy in helping to implement the NHS reforms because I didn't feel personally that they did have a, a kind of democratic basis behind them because they hadn't been in manifesto. So that was kind of the last straw for me really. And one of the messages that I have been saying to people on, on kind of personal development courses is I wish I'd listened to my inner voice much earlier than I did. I should have left several years ago and I didn't, I was scared to leave, because um, you know, you do give up a good job, you give up a pension, as you said, and I didn't really know what the future would hold, but I regret now not having left earlier, just because I could have had such a better run up to the campaign, and <laughs> been much more prepared than I was. Um, I do actually think there are a couple of other things. I've been asked recently to comment on the, um, on the reforms to the civil service, certainly if any of you were watching Francis Maud and the Cabinet Office brought out the civil service reform plans. And I get now to, to comment on those kind of things, again, which is quite fun, actually. And um, I think there are some great things in that civil service reform plan. And if we can have a smaller, faster, pacier civil service, that will be certainly good for the civil service, it will be good for the country, it will be good for you guys and your careers if you can exploit all of that. Um, I do worry that we're going to give ministers too much of a say in how they appoint civil servants in the future, and that might lead to um, an erosion of the impartiality 
in the civil service. And I think the rhetoric from some of the ministers that we have at the moment is pointing in that direction. So I think anything that you can do to resist a politicisation of the civil service is a good thing. My message from outside is you guys should be challenging that as much as you possibly can. And one of the things that I certainly felt in the last couple of years in the civil service is that we weren't challenging enough. As officials, we weren't challenging enough. And interesting in the last presentation there, the, um, the call for better data, I didn't see much evidence-based policy making in the last couple of years that I was in the civil service. And I certainly didn't see it, my challenge is I didn't see it in health. And I think part of the reason for that was we were so worried about looking receptive to a new government the other way and we didn't want to look like we were stuck in our old ways. We wanted to look flexible, we wanted to look like we were going to respond to new ministers coming in with new ideas because we genuinely want to be helpful as a civil service. But I think we went too far the other way and therefore didn't part the risks and didn't part the objective advice when we saw the scale of the reforms. And that's not just a health thing. I think we're seeing the effects of that now in education. We're seeing it in DWP as well. We needed a little bit more Sir Humphrey, I think, um, around the general election, um, and we didn't um, have that. I also would like to see the civil service getting better on diversity. I think we're great compared to other sectors, but there's still a long way to go. And we need people from all sorts of backgrounds getting into those senior roles, because our senior civil service still mirrors the lack of diversity that we have in our government, in our ministers as well. And until that changes, policy will still be ineffective, because you have to have policy makers who reflect the general public. And until you have that, you're not going to devise policy that's actually going to make a difference to the, to the broader general public. So for me, I certainly felt by the end, um, when I handed in my resignation on that day in October, that I was just that bit too far removed from why I'd come into the civil service in the first place, which was making a real difference to, to, the, to the public. So that was kind of my, um, my reasons for leaving. But I would say I did have a fantastic career in the civil service, and I would say that while you're all here, for however long you stay in the civil service, make the most of that. And, um, certainly go to as many different departments as possible and grab as many opportunities as you possibly can. So how did the um, campaign go? So leaving the civil service was one thing, but then um, deciding what I was going to do next was a, a, a totally different uh, decision. And I did, I guess, what was quite a radical thing, in that I decided to throw my hat in the ring for the London mayoral election. Um, it seemed like a strange thing to a lot of people at the time, but actually there was a logic behind it. And I've been involved with some of the thinking and the work that was going on around the creation of elected mayors in other cities. Um, the Institute for Government was doing some work on this, and the police commissioner roles as well. So I was, my mind was in the kind of, if I'm gonna go and be more public and be more political, how can I do that without immediately going into a party political system? Because I do believe our party politics is a bit broken at the moment and needs to get better. So I didn't want to go straight from the civil service into party politics. And actually, I do feel very strongly that these roles where you're voting for an individual person should be um, right for strong independent candidates to come forward. And I'd like to see a lot more of that. So, when, once I started thinking, actually, and a couple of people said to me, well, if you're thinking of going into politics, there are these roles out there that aren't party political. Have you thought about standing for one of them? And when a couple of people said that to me, I started looking into it more seriously. And then when I realised, actually, it was going to be a rerun of 2008, you're going to get the, the same candidates coming forward for these elections, who weren't particularly good last time around. I thought, well, why not? There's absolutely nothing stopping me from doing this. What I learned during the campaign, which I think, I hope, um, will, will give you kind of um, things to think about in terms of your own career, was a lot about um, how do you define yourself and who you are and kind of your brand and be, um, you know, your personal impact. I had to make an impact very quickly in this campaign because I handed in my resignation in October. Um, I thought they would let me go, but Una didn't. She asked me to stay until January. So I only had from January until, until March, when the election campaign kicked off officially, 
to actually get the five million voters in London to even know I existed. And I haven't really thought that bit through, you know, realising that actually I was up against two of the best known politicians, certainly in London, but actually in the country, Ken and Boris. You know, everybody knows who they are. So it was a real lesson in how do you define your brand? How do you get your messages across? And how do you do that with zero budget? I had absolutely no budget. And this, I think, is quite interesting for the civil service as well, because I've worked in press and comms in the civil service as well. And one of the barriers we always had was we have no money to do anything. So some of the things that, I'm, that I learn, I think, are useful as well back in the civil service. So very quickly, one thing I realise is there are millions and millions of brand experts out there and they've made a whole industry out of this and I think all of them came knocking on my door saying I want to create your brand for you but they are incredibly expensive. I think they're very clever branding experts um, because they have made this industry very successful and actually there isn't rocket science to this I don't think. So my my message to the civil service is when you, and, I, and we used to contract, I've contracted in kind of branding experts when I've been in the civil service, people to brand your, your policy or your projects. I know there's not a lot of money around at the moment, but it will come back into the system. I would say don't go near them, actually. There, there is not a rocket science to this. It's, to me, it was about, I had to very quickly demonstrate what it was that I stood for. So if I was gonna ask voters to vote for me, what were they voting for? And what was different about me to other people? And you have to make that as concise and memorable as possible. So in the end, um, my very small team of three people at the time, we got together and we did in my front room a kind of you know, brainstorm session and we boiled it down to, I was gonna be people, not party politics. And that sounds very obvious at the time, but to get there was actually quite a long process and we tried all other kinds of slogans and all different kinds of things and that's what, that's what we came up with. But what people wanted to know beyond that is that was fine, but what were my values then? What did I actually stand for? So I think a good brand as well has kind of image and values around it as well. We decided that we would have to have um, values that we knew we could stick to. And again, some people yesterday on the course I was at were talking about, if you're thinking about your career, how are you gonna stand out in the civil service? How are your managers when you go for interviews? What's gonna make you different? What, what is it? What's your personal brand as you're looking to further your career? And I knew for me, I boiled it down to several things, which is, I'm going to say this, unlike the other candidates, maybe bar Jamie Jones, I wanted to be honest. I didn't want to ever say anything that I didn't actually believe was true. Um, and once I put that out there as one of my values, I had to be consistent with that. And it was interesting how often the press would phone me up saying, will you give a line on this? Will you do a personal attack on so and so? And I wouldn't do that because we define that in my team as something that we were going to stick to. So being having a kind of couple of core values and sticking to them was hugely important to me. And just authenticity, what I realised very quickly was I couldn't do interviews, especially when you're live on telly, if I was trying to remember what it was I was supposed to say or toe a line, it had to actually come from me, it had to actually be something that I genuinely believed in. And looking back on my career, I think I should have used that as well more often. I think sometimes I went into a meeting saying something because somebody else had told me that this is what I was supposed to be saying. And actually, I think you're far better if you're being um, authentic. A couple of things I didn't do, a learning curve for me, is image is really important. Um, I'm going to say, especially as a woman, I think a lot of people picked up on this, but politically as well, I was supposed to have a colour. Somebody right at the start of the campaign said, you need to have a colour and choose your colour, and I didn't have a colour, and I think that worked against me. Part of the reason was... All the colours have been taken by all the other <laughs> parties, so it's quite hard to find one. Lots of people said to me, purple, have purple, but you keep for purple when you start looking into it, and the BNP have got something else. And so, um, so it's all very different. But I guess my point for you guys is, um, it's going to be a competitive field for there, out there for you as you're kind of going for those promotion chances that are there. So what can you have that sets you out from other people and be thinking about what it is that defines you in that competitive workplace? And the other thing I, I had a very steep learning curve on then, very quickly, was how do I get my messages across? Five million people, no budget, how do I actually communicate with them? And it did, even during the campaign, this reminded me sometimes of consultation exercises that I'd led on policy initiatives in the civil service. How do you actually communicate? 
who did I know who were likely, how did I know who was actually likely to support me in this campaign? So who are my stakeholders? Who are the warm groups of people out there? Very quickly, I realised I needed to identify which were the existing free channels that I can use. And obviously, TV, um, radio, so I went to those. TV, that's, as you said, that's a whole other talk, how little exposure the TV gave me. Um, and that's because they had very old-fashioned broadcasting rules based on previous party results, and they don't really have any way of dealing with independence in the process. It's a very undemocratic system that we have, and I'm currently being asked to commentate and write quite a lot on just, we talk about being a very democratic society, but actually there were people who went to that election believing there were only four candidates in that mayoral election. There were actually seven of us, but the three of us were given virtually no television coverage because of these outdated rules. So that's a whole um, different thing. But I think the civil service, what I did realise is TV blows all other channels out of the water. If you get one minute on telly, you get so much interest. It doesn't matter how much press coverage you've got. It doesn't matter how much you get in the specialist newspapers. Getting your policy ideas out on telly is the single biggest way that you can engage with the public. And I just think in the civil service, we're too cautious about doing that. We don't do that enough. Similarly, with newspapers, I had a fantastic woman that helped me on my campaign. But what she did on a very personal level is she built very good professional relationships with journalists. And it's interesting all the stuff going on with Leveson at the moment. There is a huge difference between terrible journalists and very, very good journalists. And if you can identify the good journalists and give them the facts that they need, they will present your policies in a fair, in a fair way. And having worked in press in the civil service, I think we don't explore that enough. We're very worried. And, and as a result of that, we don't get the good coverage that we need, I think, for a lot of our policy ideas. And I think ministers are quite frustrated by that. I can see the clock ticking down. The other, the other thing that I learned in terms of getting your message across, um, and this is something I would encourage all of you, if you're ever offered media training, take it. Um, I wasn't ever given any media training, but I had to do a couple of live interviews. Oh my God, it is the best possible development you can get in terms of making sure you know your brief. You brief yourself up to know the facts before you go on live TV in a way that I've never done before. Um, and you learn very quickly that no matter what somebody asks you, no matter what the interviewer asks you, you know you need to get across. When I was only getting kind of a minute on telly um, every other week or so, I knew I had three things I needed to get across and I was absolutely going to say them, no matter what the interviewer asked me, and that's quite a skill to learn. And I think if I had put the same preparation into meetings that I had during my career, I could have got a lot more out of meetings than I actually did. So going into a meeting thinking, whatever happens in this meeting, whatever anybody else is talking about, I'm going to make these three points in this meeting, I think would have been hugely valuable for me to have that um, at the, at, when I was in the civil service. Um, I'll wrap up now just with thinking back over my career and the campaign. What are the kind of three or four things that I've learned that I think stand me in good stead for whatever I go on to do in future, but also could be um, equally useful for you guys wherever you are on your career path at the moment? The first, um, the first one I've already mentioned, which is listen to your inner voice. And if, if you feel like you're not in the right place at the moment, whether that's just you're not in the right team in the department, you're not in the right department, you're not in the right sector, listen to that voice and don't delay and um, act on it. Um, and it could be that just something small around you needs to change, or it could be that, like me, you need a big life-changing decision, but I don't regret anything I did at the best time of my life. So I would say to people, listen to that inner voice. Um, just do it is my other thing. Somebody in the civil service once said to me, um, ask forgiveness, not permission. Just do it. There were so many times in the campaign where I would go, God, I need to do a press conference. How do you actually organise a press conference when you've got to... Just do it. Pick up the phone, talk to people. And again, if you don't know how to do something, just start doing it. And it's amazing um, how far that gets you. And my other, my other plea is, and this just... I love this campaign so much because of the people that I met during the campaign. And the more people I met, the more they put me in touch with other people. And I met people from all sorts of backgrounds, from really deprived backgrounds, with such energy, doing such fantastic things across London, that it inspired me to do more and more. And my plea to politicians, to public leaders, <coughs> and to officials, 
is please get out more. Get out more and meet the people that you are developing policy to help because that will make a huge difference. Thank you.